Our first speaker today is Dr. Daniel Horan, who is a professor of philosophy, religious studies, and theology, and the director of the Center for Spirituality at St. Mary's College in Notre Dame, Indiana. A columnist for the National Catholic Reporter, he is the author of 14 books, including Catholicity and Emerging Personhood, a Contemporary Theological Anthropology, A White Catholic's Guide to Racism and Privilege, and The Way of the Franciscans, A Prayer Journey Through Lent. His latest book is entitled Striving Toward Authenticity, Engaging Thomas Merton on Race, Justice, and Spirituality, due out in fall 2023. Father Daniel regularly lectures around the United States and abroad and serves on several university, academic, and publication editorial boards, including the Board of Regents at the Franciscan School of Theology. He is recipient of numerous awards for his writing and service and is co-host of the Francis Effect podcast. Please join me in welcoming Father Daniel. Good morning, everybody. As the author of the book of Genesis says, evening came and morning followed the second day. Here we are. <laughs> I'd like to begin first by expressing some notes of thanks to Father Garrett, to Sister Juliet, to the whole faculty, uh, staff, and student community of the Franciscan School of Theology and uh, the partners here at the University of San Diego. Um, I don't know about you, but I've been very impressed uh, with the turnout, the interest, the energy, uh, the spirit, as Sister Juliet uh, mentioned, of this whole gathering, and I, I, I can only imagine it's gonna keep getting better throughout the day, so I'm delighted to be here with you all. Before I begin this morning, I, I also wish to acknowledge that we are gathering on sacred land and to honor the native peoples who have been the traditional custodians of this place for generations. We particularly recognize the Kumyai people. With deep gratitude, we recognize our indigenous siblings and their cultures here within this community as well as acknowledging the land upon which we gather, in which we pray, learn, and work. The 13th century Umbrian man, Francesco de Bernardone, or St. Francis of Assisi, as he is known to us today, remains one of the most recognizable and influential historical and ecclesiastical figures of the last millennium. Obviously, you're all here, so you know that. Revered across many religious and cultural traditions for his model of peacemaking and reconciliation, care for and love of the marginalized, and recognition of and reverence for non-human creation, Francis is both beloved and caricatured. The affection for the Pavarello of Assisi, which millions of people have and continue to express, is indeed often reduced to a one or two dimensional image of a medieval romantic or a proto-hippie or a tree-hugging activist, or an ecclesiastically devout naif, or a well-meaning but dim-witted poetic fool. <laughs> Despite the edge of condesc uh, condescension, this largely approachable character called St. Francis has taken up residence in thousands of gardens and porches, as well as in colorful children's books and, let's say, maybe some outmoded musical films. Everybody loves St. Francis, even if you truly understand the multidimensional, flawed, entirely human, and simultaneously holy and sinful man that we are gathered these two days here to consider. That there is such a gap between the symbolic figure of Francis and the historical person of Francis is, I would argue, partly due to what I've come to call the birdbath industrial complex. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that strong a reaction. <laughs> <laughs> what results from this limited view of the multidimensional man from Assisi is nothing more than a lovable mascot, or an incarnation as a bear for our there. <laughs> Few of us then, with this sort of thinking, are challenged by his radical vision, his way of life, or his fundamental commitments circumscribed by the pressures of maintaining the identity of a lovable, uncontroversial, caricatured mascot 
Most people, even those who profess to live the Vita Evangelica, the gospel life that Francis proposed eight centuries ago, rarely get to see what practical, ecclesial, and theological significance the Pavarello offers the world today. We are so fortunate to benefit from the historical and textual scholarship of multiple generations of international researchers that have rescued the sources and at least part of the historical Francis from the shadows of history. Since the late 19th century through the present day, scores of women and men, religious and lay, have labored to give us renewed foundations for understanding the significance not only of the person Francis of Assisi, but also the Franciscan movement. And I should note that some of those historians, paleographers, editors, and scholars are here with us at this conference. So talk amongst yourselves at coffee. <laughs> My aim in this presentation is to draw from this important and foundational work to highlight just a few ways that Francis of Assisi remains significant today, not only for those who maintain a personal affection or devotion, nor just for those who identify as religious practitioners of one tradition or another, but for the global community more boldly, more broadly. To do that, I first want to invite us to look at the narrative quality of the Franciscan spiritual tradition. We tell stories. We think in stories. We are, in part, our stories. So what do the stories we do or do not tell about St. Francis reveal to us about who he is and who we are? Having looked at the inherently narrative quality, then, of the tradition, I want us then to consider three important themes that surface from the life and legacy of Francis. The primacy of relationship, the renunciation of power, and the family of creation. Does that sound good to everybody? Yeah. We're doing it anyways, doesn't matter. <laughs> we already loaded the slides. So who do we say Francis is? In many ways, as I mentioned a moment ago, we are the stories we tell. The stories can be true or false, they can be interesting or mundane, they can be distinctive or altogether unremarkable. And the stories we tell are not only about the specific details of our lives, in fact, they rarely are. They are instead about life and meaning and purpose and mystery. Life is narrative, which is why the first century Palestinian Jewish man who was as fully human as he was divine had to ask his friends, but who do you say that I am? Because human existence is inherently mysterious and the fullness of our identities and strivings are incomprehensible, including to our very selves, we tell stories. Like Jesus of Nazareth to his friends, we often find ourselves wondering, what is the story that makes my life meaningful to you? What are the stories that you tell about me? And what does the telling of these stories say about you? Our respective human identities exceed the bare facts we could list about ourselves. There is no bullet list, no Wikipedia page, no PowerPoint slide that could summarize it all. To convey the depth of meaning that a person's life and identity contain requires a narrative that helps gesture to a fuller sense of reality, to a fuller sense of purpose and mystery. If this is true for those of us who are finite creatures, persons and subjects as we are, how much truer is this for God? This is why Jesus not only asked about the stories people were telling about him in order to express his particular identity, it is also why Jesus told stories to others about who God is and who we are called to be. Admittedly not of this world, the kingdom of God can be likened to rich, complex, and engaging narratives expressed in parables and similes. The renowned New Testament scholar Amy Jill Levine picks up on this fact in her accurate and cleverly named book about Jesus' parables titled Short Stories by Jesus. <laughs> I know it's not explicitly a Franciscan text, but add that to your list if you haven't read it already. You won't be disappointed. Amy Jill Levine notes that not only were the stories told by Jesus in his time effective in communicating what scripture scholars call the sensus plenior, the fuller meaning of God's reign to the original listeners, 
But so effective and necessary is the storytelling form itself that versions of these narratives were told and retold and retold again by his followers to subsequent generations through oral tradition until they were written down in the current redacted form we find in the canonical gospels. And we continue to tell those stories today. Like the origins of the Christian message and community traced back to Jesus' own preaching ministry, which are shaped by his storytelling, the origins of the Franciscan movement are similar, similarly narrative in character. From the earliest days of the Minorite experiment that would grow into the, one of the most significant communities of Christian reform, friars, sisters, ecclesiastical observers, and various medieval chroniclers told striking stories about what was unfolding in the otherwise unremarkable commune in, of Assisi in the Umbrian region of today's Italy. The stories were necessary because what the narrators were describing exceeded what could be merely reported. But Francis himself also used stories in an effort to convey what this whole unplanned, spirit-led religious renewal was all about. Sometimes posed directly, others rhetorically, Francis responded to questions with stories. He might get a question like this. What does true joy look like? It is like I return from Perugia and arrive here in the dead of night. It's winter time, it's muddy and so cold that icicles have formed on the edges of my habit and keep striking my legs and blood flows from such wounds and so on and so on and so on. Francis, what does the ideal brother look like? Well, a good lesser brother is one who would possess the life and qualities of the following holy brothers, namely the faith and love of poverty, which Brother Bernard most perfectly had, the simplicity and purity of Brother Leo, the courtly bearing of Brother Angelo, the friendly manner and common sense of Brother Maceo, and so on and so on. Francis, how did this whole crazy adventure begin? Once, when I was in sin, it seemed too bitter for me to see lepers, and the Lord himself led me among them, and I showed mercy to them, and when I left them, what had seemed bitter to me was turned into sweetness of soul and body, and afterwards I delayed a little and left the world, and so on, and so on. The Franciscan tradition cannot be reduced to simple bullet points or easy slogans, despite efforts to attribute bumper sticker phrases to Francis over the years, Preach the gospel at all times, and so on, and so on, and so on. <laughs> Part of what makes that an impossible task is that the Franciscan tradition is rooted in one simple, direct aim. All of us, first order members, second order members, third order regular, third order secular members, we all share this same aim, to observe the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, period. And if the mission of the Franciscan movement is, as Francis would say, to walk in the footprints of Christ, then the means of expressing what that looks like in practice can only be genuinely conveyed in a story. One of the aims I have in this part of my presentation is, is to get us thinking not only about the importance and the unavoidable necessity of storytelling and conveying the Franciscan tradition, but how we might use those stories to help shape our imaginations, our character formation, our action in the world to actually put our Franciscan spirituality into practice. Stories are not blueprints, nor are they case law, but they are worlds into which we can enter. The stories we tell about who St. Francis was and what it means to be Franciscan now is how that tradition is maintained and lived anew. There are several ways we have come to know about the life and times of Francis and his earliest followers, especially St. Clair. Among the key sources are the writings of Francis, including his rules, the occasional contemporaneous chronicle. If you haven't read Salambani, you're missing out. Okay, two people knew who that was. I was expecting more of the Franciscan scholars to get that joke. Okay, <laughs> moving on. See, you never know what lands and what doesn't. Birdbath complex, industrial complex, that's a score. The chronicle of Salambani, gotta work on that one. We also have the pious hagiographies drafted to promote and secure the cause of canonization and the narratives of those friars who knew Francis recounted years after his death. It's this latter category that remains an intriguing genre worth a special attention. According to the Chronicle of the 24 Generals, the same general chapter that elected Minister General Crescentius of Yessi 
only my second favorite name of a minister general of the order, the first, of course, being the great Hamo of Faversham. Oh, wow, all right, not scoring today, good. I'll keep my day job as, as a theologian and not go on the road. If you're looking for baby names, don't look to the <laughs> minister's general. What a lovely newborn baby. What's the name, the nurse asked. Crescentius. Okay. <laughs> the year is 1244, and in the Chronicle of the 24 Generals, we, we read that Crescentius directed all the brothers to send the newly elected minister general in writing whatever they could truly recall about the life, the miracles, and the prodigies of Blessed Francis. Scholars believe that two converging factors led to this widespread call for recording friar recollections. The first, it was widely understood that some of the traditional narratives about the life and times of Francis uh, that had been circulating orally were not contained in the extant biographies of, uh, at, at that time, namely the life of St. Francis by Thomas of Celano and the near contemporaneous liturgical texts in Vita of Julian of Speyer. And second, those who, were, uh, who might have had firsthand experiences and memories of Francis during his lifetime were, as we all will embrace someday, our sister bodily death, were beginning to grow elderly and die, taking with them the stories they had been telling of the now canonized founder of the movement. And unless they were to be collected and put in print, they might be lost forever. The results of this call for narratives provided a couple collections that have subsequently been titled The Legend of the Three Companions and the Assisi Compilation. The former earned its name on account of the legend that three of the earliest followers of Francis, brothers Leo, Angelo, and Rufino, were the primary authors, or perhaps more accurately, narrators of its contents. The latter text was not attributed to any particular set of friars, let alone easily recognizable ones like those dubbed the Three Companions. Instead, the Assisi compilation contains recurrent references to an important authoritative phrase, we who were with him. It deployed a signal of authenticity and suggested valid testimony. While the earlier works of Celano and Speyer certainly contained many biographical tales, albeit embellished and adjusted to fit the hagiographic form, what was distinctive about these two texts is that they contained accounts of the Pavarello and the early followers not present in the authoritative vitae. As such, these early Franciscan sources are unabashedly a collection of stories. That's their primary purpose. While the legend of the three companions and the Assisi compilation were the first, these two collections would not be the last anthology of Franciscan narratives to be handed on to subsequent generations. The most famous of such collections, or at least the best known to modern readers, is called The Little Flowers of St. Francis. Show of hands, who's heard of this one? All right. You may not know Salambani, but we all know the little flowers. <laughs> Dated to the mid-14th century, it's a redacted Italian translation of an earlier Latin text of the same period known as the Deeds of Blessed Francis and His Brothers. The immense popularity of the little flowers accounts for the widespread recognition of certain common stories about the saint. Such, and you will recognize these, hands raised earlier, such as his preaching to the birds, how he brokered peace between the villagers and a certain wolf of Gubbio, how he converted, quote, three murderous robbers, end quote, to the faith and then to the Franciscan order. Now that's a seriously impressive vocation director there. <laughs> And while admittedly a late document, the power of storytelling to convey the substance and meaning of the person and figure of Francis, as well as the spirit of the Franciscan movement, is not to be easily dismissed. That's why you know these stories and you know this text. All of the early narrative documents of the Franciscan order reflect this fundamental truth of the power and purpose of storytelling, not only in a general human way, but also in a way distinctive to the Franciscan tradition. Other famous Catholic religious orders and congregations have their own significant documents, such as religious rules and constitutions. They have letters and prayers and treatises and other writings by founders. They have hagiographies penned to accentuate the sanctity of their founders and so on. So while not entirely unique, there is still something particularly notable about the Franciscan obsession with telling and retelling and redacting the retold stories. I mentioned earlier that this dates back to Francis's own lifetime. 
at least according to the various corroborating sources, which tell of his penchant for narrative explanation about key themes and principles of the nascent movement. Topics like joy, poverty, preaching the gospel, fraternity, prayer, mercy, forgiveness, and so on. But it is also clear that the first followers of Francis also could not resist telling stories about him and about the Franciscan tradition more broadly. The Latin edition of these 13th and 14th century narratives total more than 800 pages in the Analecta Franciscana. The centrality of storytelling in the Franciscan tradition serves three concurrent purposes. First, the stories, legends, and testimonies about Francis of Assisi served to keep aflame the fire of the founder's life and significance. Unlike our other mendicant cousins, the other orders that arose in the 13th century, like the Augustinians and Dominicans, the Franciscan movement tied its own sense of meaning to the meaning of the figure of Francis himself. And therefore, secondly, the stories play an important role and at times a controversial and even a political role within the order and outside it in casting and recasting the collective identity of the community, which understands its identity primarily as flowing from the founder as opposed to some singular apostolic work. So we might think of the Dominicans as preachers and teachers, for example. Famously, in the uh, Regula Non Balada, Francis says the brothers are to work, and that's about it. He qualifies it not with a particular mission or apostolate or style of work or kind of work. But the third chief purpose of the Franciscan stories is to make the tradition comprehensible and applicable in each new time and place. And this is why this aspect of the Franciscan tradition and corporate memory of Francis of Assisi is so important for us to consider today. Those who identified with the Franciscan movement, whether professed members of one or another branch of the order, or just someone attracted to the tradition itself, draw insight and in, in ascertain meaning for embodying the Franciscan charism in our present context. As such, these narratives prove valuable not because they dictate a strict description of how to live and what to do, but because that fuller meaning, the sensus plenior of the stories contain a general pattern or way of life that invites appropriation in each and every new age. So with this in mind, I wanna turn and look at three illustrations of the general pattern or way of life that Francis of Assisi leaves us as Franciscans and Franciscan-hearted people and begin to unpack what these insights might mean for us in the global context today. First, the primacy of relationship. I am fond of saying, and at times to the disappointment of my fellow Franciscans, and so I'm ready to receive the rotten tomatoes about to be thrown at me, <laughs> that the Franciscan spiritual tradition is distinctly unoriginal. Okay. <laughs> oh, I know, ooh, those are fighting words. Remember, I am also a Franciscan. <laughs> Whereas other religious traditions often go to great lengths to highlight what is distinctive or unique about them. For example, for example the Jesuits and Ignatian discernment or imaginative prayer stolen from Bonaventure. <laughs> or the Dominicans with their emphasis on education and preaching or the Benedictines with their motto of ora et labora, right? Prayer and work. Francis of Assisi was much less specific about what distinguished his particular propositum vitae, his proposed way of life. In all the rules of the Franciscan order, there is a simple description of the fundamental principle of the tradition outlined in the opening statements of, of the rule, and I mentioned it already. For instance, in the first order, the rule reads, the way and life of the lesser brothers is this, to live the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What makes that striking, and at times easy to overlook, in my opinion, is that there is nothing inherently unique here. Sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> all Christians, all of us, by virtue of our baptism, are likewise called to live the holy gospel of Jesus Christ. What's original about that? As such, there is nothing overtly innovative or special or particularly creative about the Franciscan vision for living in the world. It is fairly simple and generally unoriginal. Be the, Christian be the Christian disciple one claims to be, into which we have been called in baptism. That's it. As the Capuchin Franciscan historian Regis Armstrong once wrote, Francis of Assisi's primary aim was to live more fully his baptismal vocation, period. 
So following recognition that Francis's nearly exclusive focus was on being a better Christian disciple, according to living the gospel more seriously and walking in what he calls the footprints of Jesus Christ, we might ask ourselves today, what are the implications of such a position in the world? I would argue that Francis of Assisi came to realize that living the gospel of Jesus Christ can be summarized in terms of the primacy of relationship. Francis didn't realize this all at once. On the contrary, as he writes in his testament near the end of his life, while reflecting on the journey he and his brothers embarked upon, Francis said, And after the Lord gave me some brothers, no one showed me what I had to do. But the Lord Most High revealed to me that I should live according to the pattern of the gospel. Now, there are two key elements in this simple line that can be easily overlooked. The first is that Francis recognized that his vocation, and by extension, all those women and men who followed him and Claire, came from God. Their vocation came from God. Francis was not interested in a creative program or a, commu or a community development. It is, in fact, the radical commitment to the simplicity of gospel life that marks the Franciscan charism. The second thing is the emphasis on the Lord giving Francis some brothers. In other words, Francis didn't set out, at least initially, to invite people as Jesus does in the synoptics, or designate a brother to be vocation minister, or post advertisements around town, or do some creative TikTok to draw people to his new way of living a Christian life. Instead, Francis had to learn over time that authentic Christian discipleship is always and everywhere about relationship. Relationship with God, relationship with one another, relationship with all of creation. This was admittedly a slow process of learning, discernment, and conversion. Famously, at first, Francis believed that living the gospel more authentically meant going off by himself to live a life of prayer and penance. He sought out places in the community at the margins of his medieval society and associated with those who were the involuntary minores, the lesser ones, by no choice of their own. What the stories Francis tells about himself and that early community regularly recount highlight that you cannot be a Christian on your own. There are no independent contractor Christians. There are no sole proprietor Christians, no rogue or individual or I'll do it my way, Pache Sinatra Christians. <laughs> the absolute centrality of relationship in the Christian tradition is, as Francis came to see more clearly over time, expressed most fully in God's free choice to enter creation as part of that creation as one fully human like us. And when Jesus of Nazareth began his public ministry, he traveled as an itinerant preacher telling those short stories of the kingdom of God and a way of living that was possible, even if it was foreign to so many who lived according to the wisdom of the world, as St. Paul puts it. Jesus began his ministry calling together a community, extending the invitation to relationship to those at the margins, never refusing anybody or getting in the way of God's universal and absolute hospitality and mercy. It is only, and the scripture bears this out, so if you doubt me, go read the Bible. It is only individuals themselves who elect or opt out of that invitation to relationship. And more often than not, and this is still true 2,000 years later today, it is Jesus' own self-professed followers who get in the way of others being in relationship with God. Lord, Lord, did you hear? They're casting out demons in our name. Jesus is like, so what? Well, they didn't get the certificate. <laughs> They're not part of our group. We do it so much today. The world needs a recalibration along these lines. I believe this is one of the reasons that Pope Francis has had such an impact in his pastoral ministry. Like his medieval namesake, Pope Francis has come to realize that Christianity is all about relationship and community. And when convention or social standing or public perception or even his Swiss Guard protectors say something, do something, encourage something in conflict with the ability to extend an invitation of relationship to others, Pope Francis, like St. Francis, chooses to live the gospel and he prioritizes that relationship. 
Last night, Brother Bill mentioned um, some instances, uh, the, the, the press conference after Pope Francis's election, his installation at the Lateran. Um, I also remember the, the first Sunday after his election of Bishop of Rome. Remember the insane thing he did? As the bishop in his own diocese of Rome, he actually went on a pastoral visit and celebrated mass. I've thought for 10 years about what it must have been like to be that pastor in the sacristy. And you get a knock on the door. And it's the pope saying, do you mind if I celebrate mass? <laughs> Sometimes in my more snarky moments, I would, I would think, oh, would I have the courage to say, holy father, I worked a lot this week on this homily, and you're just going <laughs> to get my way. On a more serious note, the, the, the image from that ministry, that weekend, that stays with me is that against the advice of his well-meaning security detail, the Swiss guards, he processed out with the ministers of the liturgy and right out into the street and shook hands and greeted people like a pre priest, a pastor, a bishop should. Why was that so startling to us? This is why I think this prioritization of relationship is why Pope Francis can say without hesitation, who am I to judge? And as Brother Bill reminded us last night, he can say, we need a poor church for the poor. And he says so many other expressions that baffle those who, like Jesus' followers, want to get in the way of other people's relationship with God. Well, I do believe that sometimes the hype around fears of individualism and relativism get blown out of proportion or at least deployed for personal and problematic ends. I think it is true that we live in a world, especially in our American context, that prioritizes individual interest, capitalism and greed, and exclusionary and sectarian attitudes. More and more people look out primarily for themselves and those in the respective tribes or like-minded groups. We see it in local and global politics. We see it in our families, in our communities. We even see it in the church. One of the ways Pope Francis, I'm sorry, one of the ways St. Francis of Assisi continues to be relevant today is through the challenge of prioritizing relationship that is at the heart of the Christian vocation, even if so many self-identified self Christians have forgotten it. Francis of Assisi is a model of what it looks like to start from a well-meaning position of isolation and individualism, right? When he first began to practice penance, by himself, those nearly three years where he was kind of figuring it out on his own, sometimes rebuilding physical churches. But ultimately, he was converted to see that the Lord has not only given him friar brothers and Franciscan sisters, but lepers and the materially poor and all those at the margins with whom God is calling him into relationship and community. The same is true for us. The renunciation of power, point two. One of the most misunderstood dimensions of the Franciscan tradition is the embrace of poverty. Part of the reason I believe that this is the case stems from the limited language we have in discussing poverty in all its manifold dimensions. Most people hear the word poverty and immediately think of abject or material poverty, which is, without qualification, an evil to be protested and overcome. God does not wish nor does God delight in those who suffer from abject or material poverty, which is that condition of lacking those basic things necessary for human flourishing that is evil, that is never to be romanticized or celebrated. Yet on the other extreme, there have been those who have misinterpreted or misapplied uh, the passage in Matthew 5 uh, in the reference to being poor in spirit. Luke just says, blessed are the poor, period. Matthew, this poor in spirit has caused a headache for the church for a while because some, not all, but some have used that as an excuse to justify a disconnect between one's own social standing and perhaps material wealth from one's life of faith. We see this sort of distortion of the gospel in Christian life most overtly in those who preach the so-called prosperity gospel. There is then no recognition that God is calling all people to examine how they live and, and the impact of lifestyle on the broader community. By contrast, evangelical or gospel poverty, which is what Jesus modeled and Francis of Assisi strove to embrace, is something different. It is a manner of being in the world that seeks to align with God's vision for how we ought to live, what St. Paul calls the wisdom of God, which, as St. Paul also reminds us, to people who operate with this worldly thinking are going to think you're nuts, right? Foolish, stupid. 
This wisdom of God is opposed to the uncritical embrace of the wisdom of Wall Street or Silicon Valley or Davos. In the end, evangelical poverty is another way of talking about relating differently to power structures in society. It is, as St. Francis modeled it, a form of renouncing power. Power is not just about positions of authority or influence, but the very dynamic force that ties people together through social relations. Francis of Assisi appears to have understood this intuitively, namely that power exists in a pervasive and fundamentally relational way and it can be exercised or used for the betterment or the subjugation of others. The child of a wealthy cloth merchant in the 13th century, Francis was not immediately aware of this dynamic that, from his familial vantage point, was covered over by the material and social wealth and power that his family increasingly gained. It was over the course of several years during his young adulthood that he came to grips with the plight of those in the world whom he had never previously cared to consider. As the Franciscan historian Michael Cusato keenly notes, in that encounter with the experience of the marginalized, especially the lepers outside the city of Assisi, who were men and women whom he had always considered abhorrent or of no consequence, Francis had his eyes open onto a whole world of suffering humanity, which up to that time, he had been socialized by the values of Assisi to ignore, to avoid, and to despise as repugnant and useless blots upon social life. Francis's response, inaugurated by this liminal experience of fraternal recognition in the so-called other, led to what he would come to identify as his desire to live the gospel life. It's the cornerstone of which was embrace, the embrace of which was an evangelical poverty. Cusato explains that Franciscan love of poverty flows out of a more fundamental posture which the friars had adopted towards the use and abuse of power. In his book, Francis of Assisi and Power, the French historian Jacques Delarune argues that what was really the fundamental issue at stake for Francis in his particularly idiosyncratic way of life according to the gospel was not poverty as an end in itself, but rather poverty as a strategy for the renunciation of power. Delarone explains, Francis chose to establish in a rule of religious life the conditions shared by the most powerless classes in the society of his time, destitution, precariousness, itinerancy, and manual labor. He showed a loathing for all forms of power that went far beyond the scorn of the world as found in the monastic and ascetic tradition. With Francis, there is less a merely visible break with the world. At the heart of his life, there is instead more intransigence toward any compromise with the world and its powers. Very different than what we see in the birdbath. Power and evangelical poverty are intimately connected in Francis's way of life. Dallarune explains that the lesser model advocated by the Pavarello, Pavarello in his first fraternity was in no way that of an urban bourgeois religious life, but adjoining in the conditions of the most powerless, who can be identified through the concrete study of their living conditions. For example, the seasonal agricultural worker. For Francis, everything about the gospel life was rooted in the inherent relationality of the human person as the image of God. Just as God humbled God's self to become human like us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, and then proceeded to live in the world according to the priority of service, love, peace, and reconciliation, so too all people are called to do likewise. The humility of the incarnation and the poverty of Christ served as Francis's template. Francis desired that nothing should get in the way of one's ability to embrace and relate to others, just as Christ allowed nothing to get in the way of his embrace and relationality with others. Again, Michael Cusato, I think, helps illuminate this connection between poverty and power. He writes, it is nonetheless imperative to understand Francis's own sensitivity to how power was used and abused within society and the church, and by extension within the order itself. We're not off the hook. <laughs> there is, in other words, a question of power within Francis in the early fraternity because there is a question about how power was used and abused outside the order. For Francis was keenly aware not only of the various forms of power that were operative in Assisian society, like money, military force, ownership of land, etc., but most especially 
how the, that power came to be used to the detriment of its, of its weakest members, the poor. The twofold process of becoming aware of the always already operating dynamics of power and then seeking to renounce those practices of power that subjugate and oppress others could only truly take place for Francis when one divests oneself of all things that get in the way of relationship with others. That might be material goods, social status, prejudices, judgments, preconceived notions, and so on. This process of embracing evangelical poverty is the process of moving closer to solidarity with the poor and the marginalized. It is also, as liberation theologian Gustavo Gutierrez has observed, a process of simultaneous protest against abject material poverty and the systemic structures of oppression that maintain such disparity and abuse. It is not difficult to see how this characteristic of Francis of Assisi's life and story continues to be timely today. Nor is it challenging to see how the renunciation of power through the embrace of evangelical poverty is lived out in the life and ministry of Pope Francis. There is so much more to say about the application of this insight, not only in the material or financial sense, but especially in the hierarchical, social, and ecclesial senses. Perhaps we'll have time in our conversations throughout the day to discuss how this applies to matters, for instance, of gender equity, anti-racism, LGBTQ inclusion, support for migrants and refugees, and so many other instances. But for the sake of time, and so I don't get played off by that music we heard earlier, <laughs> let me turn to my last point. As I mentioned at the outset, I've come to call the widespread depiction of Francis as a romantic, naive, poetic, tree-hugging proto-hippie who lives in the garden, the consequence of the birdbath industrial complex. While everybody loves their St. Francis in the Garden birdbath mascot, most people are unaware of the radical vision of creation he embodied and passed down through the Franciscan spiritual tradition. Rather than just a naive romantic, Francis was profoundly realistic and grounded in the riches of sacred scripture and the tradition. This is reflected in the teaching and ministry of the current Bishop of Rome. Many people, including scientific experts and intergovernmental organizations such as the UN, have argued that global climate change poses one of the greatest existential threats to human and non-human creation alike. Recognizing the dire circumstances, and by the way, Brother Bill had the same picture up yesterday. We did not collaborate. It is the work of the Holy Spirit, in case you doubted. Pope Francis, in 2015, released his impressive encyclical letter, Laudato Si. The encyclical directly addresses, as we know, the climate crisis and humanity's direct responsibility in exacerbating the problem. While numerous societies around the globe have taken seriously the critical challenges facing the planet, many welcoming Laudato Si as a sign of faith-based allyship, sadly still, the reception here in the United States over the last seven years has been especially disappointing, including among entities within our own Catholic and broader Christian community. While the Dato Si offers a sweeping theological and spiritual vision for how Catholic social teaching can rightly respond to the ecological signs of our times, its emphasis on stewardship and persistent anthropocentric framework may not adequately respond to the challenges contemporary spiritual seekers and we as Franciscans especially concerned about the immediate need for change might desire. For this reason, I have argued that we might view Laudato Si as a liminal text, an in-between, a bridge between a kind of stewardship model of creation that's popular in a lot of Christian circles today toward the kinship or family of creation model represented by the Franciscan theological tradition. There are several key Franciscan insights that arise from St. Francis' own life and work, as well as those who have come after him, which might serve as resources for contemporary people from all backgrounds looking to respond to global climate change. I wanna highlight three. First is the spiritual vision of Francis's canticle of creature, creatures. Despite caricatures that reflect mistaken interpretations of the canticle as some romantic work of fiction, scholars have noted how it in fact reveals a profound sense of the natural world's interconnection, interdependence, and interrelatedness. This integral vision of the cosmos includes all creatures, human and non-human alike, and reflects Francis's recognition of non-human creaturely agency and capacity for divine relationship. This sense of ecological spirituality invites all people, believers and non-believers alike, 
to consider our shared origins and our relationship with all else in the natural world, thereby decentering the human person, which Pope Francis has called us to do, as the sole focal point of creation and resituate our species within a robust sense of the evolutionary universe. If we think creation in the cosmos is all about us, what the heck was going on for 13 and a half billion years before we showed up? <laughs> Furthermore, this foundational Franciscan vision of creation echoes the profound spiritual wisdom of so many indigenous traditions around the globe, which invites dialogue and collaboration further, especially from a Franciscan perspective. Next, I wanna propose that we celebrate the ecological virtue of pietas, the Latin word that's often translated in English as piety, as presented by the medieval Franciscan theologian Bonaventura Bandaregio. He offers us an underappreciated spiritual framework for thinking about a non-anthropocentric way of being in the world, despite the fact that Bonaventure was often himself pretty anthropocentric. He, he looks at the ancient Roman civic virtue of pietas as a constructive framework. Basically, unlike our popular usage of piety, to refer to those who are uh, observably reverent or devotional in particular religious traditions. Or as I sometimes say, most people hear piety and they think old ladies at da daily mass, right? <laughs> With all due respect to our elder siblings at, who go to daily mass. <laughs> Bonaventure draws from the original Roman meaning of pietas, how it was used to understand primarily a filial sense of relationship the care of one's parents and secondarily to other members of one's family. This idea is that we care for one another, we have a duty or an obligation, not because of some outside kind of requirement or pressure, but because it's part of what it means to be related. Bonaventure plays on the traditional understanding of piety as one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, and he reinterprets it through the exemplarity of Francis's creation spirituality to make a case that we ought to care for non-human creation not because we are called to be stewards of things we would prefer to use and should have in better reserve, right? Stewardship means to preserve oftentimes, but because we are intrinsically related to the rest of creation as part of one cosmic family. Acknowledging a fraternal and sororal bond that is inextricably present among all creatures by virtue of creation's single origin in God, Bonaventure's emphasis on pietas is a call to care for creation stemming not from an external obligation or responsibility, but from an internal or even intrinsic familial duty as one would care for a family member. A third distinctive insight, and this is going to appear to many to come out of left field, and I see we're about to play the music, so I'm landing the plane, I promise. <laughs> is something that I would invite us to, to reappropriate in the context of ecological spirituality, create, care for creation, is this term usus pauper, which in, translated from Latin means restricted use or poor use in English. This idea finds its origins in the work of the medieval Franciscan theologian Peter of John Olivi in response to an otherwise esoteric concern about the proper interpretation of the religious vow of poverty in the 13th century. The core of the debate centered on how to understand the Franciscan commitment to live sine propria without anything of one's own, which is the Franciscan understanding of the vow of poverty. Some had proposed that as long as a Franciscan friar did not have de jure ownership, legal, technical ownership, they could use things they had access to however they saw fit. So if anyone would like to lease a Mercedes for me to drive around in, that would be A-OK -okay according to that <laughs> interpretation. As long as it's, my name's not on the title. But Olivi believed that the call to follow the example of Christ required greater discernment and reflection beyond merely claiming a lack of technical ownership. Instead, he argued that the very manner of use itself ought to reflect the way God intended us to use the goods of the earth, and this was expressed in the terms usus pauper, restricted use, or the use of things in the manner most keeping with Christ's model of the divestment of goods. There's a lot more to say about that, but I, I, and we can talk offline about this if you'd like. The idea is it's an invitation to discern. We have to use non-human creation. We have to eat whether it's plant life or animal life, we need to use other creatures just like other creatures use us in relationship. But how do we decide to make decisions and interpret the call to be good family members, good, pious members of creation? These are just three ways that the life and spiritual vision of St. Francis continues to bear contemporary relevance 
at both the local and global scale, and there's so much more work to do and so many more conversations to have. So in closing, if there's one thing I want to encourage us to consider as we leave here, it's this. What are the stories we tell about St. Francis of Assisi that not only convey meaning of his life and legacy, but also help to shape our own sense of understanding? The Franciscan tradition, like Christianity generally, is a narrative tradition that requires our ongoing storytelling to shape and reshape, form and reform the process of our meaning making. Do we find ourselves as Franciscans and Franciscan-hearted people remaining at the level of the superficial, telling simplistic and comfortable stories about who St. Francis was and why he matters? Or do we dare to be shaped by the profound and challenging call to live the gospel that Francis put before us? Do we think and act reflecting the Franciscan primacy of relationship? Or do we put ourselves or our preferred groups first, accepting those stories from the tradition that we find affirming and comfortable? How do we relate to social and ecclesial power structures? Do we embrace the call to voluntary minoritas through evangelical poverty, or do we view ourselves and others according to the distorting wisdom of the world? What is our view of and relationship with the rest of creation? Do we accept the fundamental truth that we are creatures too, that we are interdependent, that we are part of God's singular cosmic family? Or do, we or do we continue to envision ourselves as a part, as lords and stewards of something unrelated to us and held at arm's length? As we think about the signs of our times at both the local and the global levels, may we be encouraged and challenged by the life and vision of St. Francis, whose complex and profound story continues to inspire so many people today, including the Bishop of Rome, who is the first to take his name. Pope Francis. Thank you.